Now, this is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, DJ Python Hyena, real name Greg Gilbert. And um, I have a great guest on here this evening. In fact, uh, got him through uh, another another guest who uh, more or less described him as, uh, in my my opinion, described him as a Clark Kent when I discovered him more or less to be a Superman. <laughs> Folks, I have the great author Mike uh, Aloisi, is that how you pronounce your last name? Did I get her line Frank, wrong? Yeah, Aloisi. Aloisi, my apologies. Author, I'll call you Author Mike. <laughs> that, that, that's why I actually chose that name, because no one can say the last name, so it's a lot easier people to remember. Oh, there we go. How you doing? I'm good, how are you? Oh, I'm not doing too bad. You ever been uh, out this way? This is uh, for, uh, New Brunswick in Canada. Um, I've been in Canada a lot. I'm not sure near the New Brunswick area. Uh, I used to go to Toronto all the time. I actually just went out with my wife a couple in February to go to the Ice Hotel, I think, over in Montreal. Well, the closest we have to celebrities here are the Trailer Park Boys. Are you familiar with them? <laughs> I haven't watched it, but I see a lot of uh, people love that and post stuff about them on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a petition going on on Facebook to get them to, uh, to host the uh, Saturday Night Live, and I think it should happen. <laughs> That'd be funny. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting how I come to c in contact with you because uh, I've been um, I've been reviewing movies since 1996, and I've been here at CHSR since 2005. But uh, I didn't start podcasting until April of 2015 when I ended up uh, surprisingly landing an interview with Tommy Wiseau of The Room. And uh, that led to interviews with some really cool people, and uh, including people from uh, the Friday the 13th alumni. I know you're associated with Kane Hodder. Yep. And uh, I, I remember I, I, after Tommy Wiseau, I kind of sat at my computer wondering who else I can interview. And uh, one person I remember I really wanted to talk to was Adrian King from the original. And I was just starstruck when I got a response from her. And she came on and she couldn't have been any lovelier. Yes, yeah, she's very nice. Yeah, I, I like her, and um, and uh, suddenly I got this message from David Grove, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know how he had come to contact me. Uh, it was on Facebook, and uh, I asked him. I remember when I interviewed him, I asked him if he had uh, had heard my interview with Adrian King, and he had stated that he hadn't. So I it was kind of a mystery to me how that happened, but. <laughs> Yeah, I figured he wrote the book on uh, on location in Blairstown, the making of Friday the Thirteenth. So I uh, had him on and had a wonderful interview with him. Good. And uh, I remember uh, in the interview he'd mentioned that Tom Savini had forwarded his book. Book, and I said to him, I said, you know, would it be possible to get Tom Savini on here? And this is where it gets interesting. He says, well, I'll I'll give you the email to my publisher. And uh, so I messaged you, and um, I remember you stated something about Tom usually doesn't do a lot of podcasts and whatnot. What David Grove didn't tell me <laughs> is all of your backstory <laughs> about uh, who you are, and that kind of blew my mind. Like, uh, like you described you almost like a Clark Kent when you're a Superman. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, quite an interesting life. Yeah, so give us some of your background. Uh, well, from from New England in Massachusetts, and I uh, grew up a huge you know movie fan, and uh, so I went to film school. I got two degrees in filmmaking. I got a, an associate in television, and then I went to New York City and got a, a bachelor's degree in film directing. And um, after that, I started a production company in New York and doing some small industrial commercials and videos and stuff. Um, and realized that my true passion was actually writing so i sold the company and went back to school and i got my master's actually in england and um got my mfa in writing and started doing books and stuff and eventually i got hooked up with um kane hodder and, and who was jason for our 13th movies and all of a sudden now i work with tons of horror movie stars and write biographies for them write 
um, all kinds of stuff. Um, and during that process, I started my own company um, called um, AM Inc. and Dark Inc., which uh, is our horror line. And we have about 40-something books out and a lot of celebrity books and do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, at the same time, when I was younger, um, from when I was 19 until 29 years old, I was um, the official Spider-Man for Marvel Comics, um, to where I actually dressed up as Spider-Man and went all over the world, went to over 20 countries and 30-some-odd states in America, um, dressing up and doing appearances, basically like store openings or promoting the movies and stuff like that. Um, I would do things like go to the Senate, go to the Pentagon, um, hand over million-dollar checks, open and close the stock market, um, crazy weird things that you know you never think of that people do for a living. And um, even wrote shows for Marvel Comics. I directed videos for them. I did all kinds of different stuff. And so that's kind of the, the weird, interesting uh, youth I had. And now I went from being a superhero to working with horror movie stars and kind of a weird little path. Just curious, what did you think of the Spider-Man movies? Um, the first three I loved because they, ke they kept me really busy. Um, because I was doing Spider-Man time, so when the movies come out, I would actually, you know what, I actually went to Canada twice during for the premieres, I think. Okay. Um, doing appearances up there. Um, so every time the movies came out, I, I would be on tour for, for months and months, so I loved them at the time. Um, when Spider-Man 3 came out, I actually was in Asia for three months in Asia doing appearances of Spider-Man. Um, and the newer ones, actually, I liked those a lot, too. I thought Andrew Garfield was really a, a good uh, um, Spider-Man, but then also the new kid in... The, uh, the new Last Captain America movie was pretty awesome, so they're fun. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've done, um, since April 2015, I have done, you're actually my 49th interview wow. <laughs> that I've done. I'm. You want to talk about a passion. This. I'm surprised I'm able to do this. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and... I was looking over your books, the list of books that you've done, and um, I did not know prior to this, but certainly not through David. And uh, and again, you know, D David Grove. Um, actually, I should ask this. How did you become affiliated with David Grove? Um, actually, when Kane's biography came out, um, we were just starting off as a company. And basically, Kane... I approached him because I was a huge fan of his, and he had offers from huge publishers all over, uh, but he didn't feel comfortable with them because they thought they would censor him so much. Okay. And we really connected together, and you know, I told him we'll never put the book out until he was perfectly happy with it. And so when the book came out, um, it was such a big hit, and everyone loved it so much that all of a sudden everyone in horror wanted to work with us because, you know, Kane's like one of the, the biggest godfathers there is of, of horror. So everyone was like, well, if Kane trusted this guy and, you know, the, com the company, then, you know, it must be legit, must be good. And then all of a sudden people just came out of the woodwork and approach us. And David was one of them. He um, he did the uh, Friday the 13th book before that, which I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, and he had this new book, and he came to me and, you know, sent me a query letter and just uh, asked if I would look at it. And I looked at it, and I loved it. And so we started, signed a contract and just started working together. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Kane Hodder because um, I've already interviewed back in February. I had the pleasure and honor of having Ted White on here. Oh, very nice. Oh, man. You, you want to talk about a guy with a story. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And um, I'll tell you, at 90 years old, he never missed a beat. And the, yep. the, the whole man, the stories that he told. It's interesting because um, we talked a little bit about Kane Hodder, and he um, he said very nice things about Kane. But I'm going to tell you something really interesting happened to me during that interview with him, and uh, and I don't know what it is about me. Um, I can tell you I am trustworthy, but I've never had an interviewee, and he didn't do this live during the live interview. He did this uh, during an email. But he had sent me the phone numbers of Kane Hodder and Judy Aronson. 
<laughs> and he said over the, like during the interview, I told, I said, don't say them all online. He, he kept forgetting. Oh, that's right. We, we don't want to do it over the air. But I was like, um, I couldn't believe the trust that he put in with me. With me. And uh, he had said that he's got a very good vibe about people. And he could tell that I had a passion for this. And yeah, I haven't heard from Kane. Uh, I would joke with people. I said, Kane's probably afraid of the podcast guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know he's he's busy. I mean he gets it's insane the amount of requests he gets a week alone. It's it's crazy. And Judy Aronson, I think she's just shy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think she. I yeah. Um, that's I don't know. I I'm, I'm going to keep working on them, but um, I know it's Judy Aronson. I've messaged a couple of times. There'd be the little check marks appear on Facebook saying it's been read, and I'm like, just say yes or no. You know, uh, yeah. But um, nonetheless, you know, Kane Hodder, like, I was reading over your book t today, the, and I could not believe one thing that stood out to me um, was that Kane Hodder went through something I went through when I was young. I've been out of high school for over 25 years, and I was bullied severely, and I could not believe that Kane Hodder was a bully victim. And it's amazing how many people connect to that. Um, I mean, because we've done conventions all over the world together and stuff, and every convention someone comes up to him, comes up to me, and starts talking about how, you know, they were bullied and the book really helped them, you know, connect to it and open up about it and stuff. So it's, it's a, you know, it's something that everyone can connect to and stuff. And the fact that a, you know, big tough guy who plays one of the most famous killers of all time was also bullied is, you know, kind of powerful for people. Yeah, out of the Jasons that he played, like, uh, which one of those Friday the 13th did you like best? Um, part 7 has always been my favorite, um, just because the makeup alone is incredible, um, but also because it was the one that was on all the time when I was a kid. It was always on, it was on USA, like, all the time. Every, every year, on every Friday the 13th, they would do the marathons, and for some reason, they always played Part 7, 8. So, yeah, Kane was the, the Jason of my childhood. Well, um, part seven, an interesting story about that. I saw that in the theater. Now, I'm 44 years old, but when that came out in 1988, I was not 18 years old. My, <laughs> my older brother was 17, and somehow we got in to see that movie. <laughs> but, uh, no, we saw part seven in the cinemas here, and... Um, yeah, there was, I remember there was a guy dressed up as Jason ripping the tickets, you know, and <laughs> nobody bothered to check our ID, but we get in and we watch the movie. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, yeah, Kane Hodder played a great Jason, but I felt really bad that they did not have him back for Freddy vs. Jason. Yeah, yeah, it's still a big, uh, big issue with everyone. Yeah, because it would have been great to see him and uh, Robert England uh, play off each other, you know. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, but, of course, they, they didn't even have Robert England back for even the Freddy remake. So it's it's almost yeah. like they're passing these people off. And in a way, I, I don't know if that's fair for the, the veteran fans that grew up with it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, you know, the studios don't, they're not diehard fans, all the people who are the bigwigs, you know. So they, they look at it as, you know, they're monsters, no one cares, and don't understand that, have the passion that everyone has for them and stuff, and so they just throw other people in it and, you know, trying to revitalize it and start it over and stuff, and it just doesn't usually work. Yeah. Well, yeah, you did, uh, I think you got a couple of books on here that you did on Kane Hodder. You, uh, Killer and I, On the Road to Hell, and Unmasked. Now, Unmasked, that's his official biography, right? Yep, Unmasked the the biography, and The Killer and I is, it started off as a blog, um, because he has such a big fan base that we, I would write a blog about the process of the book to kind of keep people updated what was going on, and, you know, when the book's going to come out and stuff, and Kane and I end up having such a, a weird chemistry together, it was like this odd couple to where I'm this wuss scared of everything, and he's this tough guy, and he would do all these crazy stuff to me that the blog became more and more popular to the point where it was read in about 52 countries a week. Um, and so we decided to release it as a book. Um, and the book did great 
to the point where we actually filmed a reality show about it, and so Kay and I have our own little reality show that we did um, during the book tour, and then now there's a sequel coming out called The Killer Eye on the Road to Hell. So, yeah, we've had uh, quite a bit of stuff together, Kay and I. Oh, you guys are going to do another book. Yep, yeah, it was basically the... The Killer and I is about the making of the book, and then The Killer and I and The Road to Hell is about the, the six-month book tour we did. You know, it's interesting because when I interviewed Ted White, Ted White was talking about that he was um, part of a documentary on Kane Hodder, and he was asked to speak yep. about him. Uh, yeah, basically, they're doing a documentary right now called um, To Hell. I think it's called The Hell and Back. I could be getting it wrong for some reason. Um, and it's um, inspired by, by the book that I wrote on Mast. And it's basically Kane's life story. Um, I'm in it. Uh, Ted's in it. Bruce Campbell's in it. Um, tons of big uh, stars are all in it and stuff. And it's going to be really, uh, really, really good. And it should be coming out, I think, early next year. Do we get to see Kane Hodder beat up Bruce Campbell? <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. I know Sam Raimi always talks about finding ways to abuse him. <laughs> yeah. No, but... Um... Yeah, that, that, I know there was part where you they mentioned that he had a massive burn injury during um, a stunt that he performed. Was that that in part seven? Uh, no, he actually, um, that, that's the whole meat of the book. That's like the big, massive part of the book is his, his burn story because it was such an awful um, event to where he suffered third-degree burns over more than 50% of his body, pretty much. Oh. Um, and he spent a very, very long time in the hospital. He almost died several times. Um, and so the book is really about how he overcame that and um, to go on to be a legendary stunt guy. Because basically, when he had the burn, he only did one TV show ever. He never did anything else. Um, had the burn, and the doctors told him he would never even be able to lift his arm again. He wouldn't be able to, to move properly because his skin was so... Um, you know, uh, scarred and stuff. So it's kind of a the emotion, the motivational story about how he overcame that and stuff. When the boats did that happen? Was that uh, in the early eighties? What? Uh, late seventies. He did. Oh, late seventies. Of, of emergency, the old TV show in the seventies. Okay. And, yeah, and then he ended up um, going back home, and he got burned doing a, a stunt on his own. It wasn't for a TV show or movie or anything. Because I remember, you know, he had that brief scene in um, House 2, the second story, where he had the grill outfit on. I was wondering if it yeah. was before that. Yep. Yeah, in House, he, he actually did all the stunts in House, and that was, like, the little cameo he has. Yeah. Yeah, House 2, the second story. My one complaint about that, I would never have let a woman as gorgeous as Lar Park Lincoln walk out of that house he opens that cupboard up, or that pterodactyl, and he shows it to Charlie, the one guy that believes him. I'm like, it's so frustrating. He never shows it to her. I would never let her walk out. <laughs> uh, it's frustrating screenwriting. Yep. But yeah, um, so how long would you say you've known Kane? Uh, excuse me. Uh, we first met in, I believe, 2000 and. 10 or so uh, is when we, we met and got met the, got the contracts and started writing the book. Um, so it's been about six years or so that we've been kind of hanging out. He's you know, basically my best friend now. Wow. You know, it's, yeah. it's kind of the same feeling with me. Like, I'm still in touch with a lot of the people I've interviewed. And um, it's interesting the the bond when um, when nobody feels threatened by you, you know, and they they know that you're professional. It's interesting the ties they had, and the people I've interviewed will come. Well, if they have something they're promoting, they know that uh, they could trust me to do it. Um, was it something that um, took you by surprise? Like, were, are, do you sometimes uh, think to yourself, "Wow, I can't believe that uh, I'm good friends with this guy." Uh, yeah, I mean, it, basically, you know, I never, A, when I, you know, reached out to him, I never thought anything would happen with it. Um, and I honestly was at a convention um, before I started doing all this stuff, and I said, and I met four different Jasons, and I got all their autographs, and I said to my wife, I said, if I could meet Kane Hodder, I could die happy. And now I'm sitting in the phone rings, I'm like, ah, oh, Kane's calling, what does he want? You know, so it's like this, it's hysterical that, you know, he's now somebody I talk to basically every single week, and... You know, we go bend them all over the world together and stuff. And in the same aspects, it's like, you know, I've I've had dinner with Robert England. I've, you know, met Bruce Campbell at things. I've, you know, done 
ridiculous things. I've hung out with Lance Hendrickson in, in Sweden. You know, it's like I've gotten to meet all these different celebrities and do all these different things because of, you know, the opportunity that Kane gave me and stuff. So it's it's rather surreal looking at my, my phone and seeing, like, oh, look, there's Tom Savini's number. There's, you know, Robert Kurtzman's number. There's, you know, all these different people and stuff. And every once in a while I have to sit back and, and remind myself self how uh, how cool that is. You know what? I, I couldn't have put it any better myself because I think like that every day. And it, ever since the Tommy Wiseau interview, like I said, you're number 49, and I've got yeah. Lisa Wilcox next week. Oh, cool. And, and it's like, I can't believe it. It's like, you know, how is this happening? But um, yeah. I, I always stay out of the dirt, though, too. And, you know, people, fans, they want to hear about the movies. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. But you had some other interesting books on here. Arm Candy caught my attention. Now, <laughs> tell me about that. Uh, Arm Candy is its about a celebrity escort, but not the kind you're thinking, not a sexual <laughs> one. It's about a, a guy whose job um, for many years was to, at like the Oscars, to meet Tom Cruise and walk him down the red carpet, bring him to a seat, bring him to their after parties. Um, and things like that. So it's kind of a behind the scenes of a job that most people never knew existed. Um, and I co-wrote the book with the 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 actual guy, and um, it was a, it was a huge hit for me. And um, the book was a big hit because it was, you know it involves all the celebrities and stuff and all that kind of you know kind of gossipy a little bit stuff. And it was on E News, it was on Extra, it was on a cover of Vogue in Italy, it was on People Magazine, Us Weekly. It was a uh, Rather, uh, rather popular book. Um, so, th- so it wasn't you doing the escorting. I was under that no, impression. No. Okay, no. I was gonna, I was gonna say, you know, there was a lot of beautiful celebrity women there that any guy wouldn't mind having on their arm. Oh yeah, I definitely would have. If you, yep. What would you say was the most interesting uh, story you heard with regards to that? Um. I think one of them that's in the book is about uh, uh, when oh, I'm gonna forget the name um, when Brad Pitt was it was the Demi Moore who was she with Bruce Willis or Ashton Kutcher I think it was Ashton Kutcher and um, he was with with Ashton Kutcher and somebody like the ex of of their his wife or something so for the first time they have actually met in person and it was like a really awkward situation. Uh, it was a better story than I'm remembering right now, but it, like it's kind of a it was kind of cool for him to like experience, you know, something that every gossip magazine would have like loved to have gotten a picture of, kind of thing, you know. And uh, you got other books too. Like sometimes you write under the name Michael Gore, and you got a, a book called Tales from um, the Mortician. Yep, that's um, a collection of horror short stories. That's actually one of my favorite things I've written because I'm such a, a horror nerd that that's like the stuff I really like. Uh, and it's written by a pen name because um, my earlier books had a very big um, middle-aged housewife following that I didn't want to risk them ever picking up that book and reading it and be like, what the hell? Because it's, you know, it's really gory stuff, so I didn't want to offend people, not offend people, but, you know, it was a very different audience than I normally write for. So, so he, that's my, my name for my, my darker horror stuff. Do you have a favorite film franchise? Like, you, you like horror films. Do you have a favorite franchise? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's Friday the 13th was, was my my thing growing up. Like, Jason was always my favorite stuff. And it was because um, I was petrified of horror movies as a kid. Same you here. Know, my mom didn't like them. No one didn't like them, so I never watched them. And I was 13, and a buddy of mine rented Friday the 13th Part 3, and I made every excuse in the world not to watch it to try to get out of there. And then I watched it and realized, wait a minute, this is pretty cool. I get to see boobs and like, and it's cool, and there's people getting killed, and and so they kind of like bonded it for me, like you know that relationship with Jason, which is kind of a weird thing, but you know, it, it it's planted the seed of horror in my mind and stuff. So, so I always had uh, from then on, I had you know little Jason figures in my room and posters my whole life and stuff. So. You know, um, it's interesting with me with the Friday franchise, because just like you, I was afraid of horror films growing up. And um, I got kind of baited into watching Friday the 13th Part 2, and what an educational time it was for me, because, um, and I'll tell you why, I shared this with Adrian King, and she got a cut chuckle out of it. It was the first time 
I had seen a naked woman. That was Kirsten Baker. Yep. That was the first time I seen uh, notice that a woman looks different under the clothes than men. <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm going to tell you that was the time. There was like three killings before that, and that was when my mother rushed in and turned the television off. <laughs> was during that she took her clothes off. I must have had a favorite female in every one of the movies. You mentioned part three. For me, it was Tracy Savage. I wish she had to survive. <laughs> But I had a favorite female in every one. I've had the pleasure of having a few of them on here. Adrian King, Melanie Kenneman has yep. been on here. And, um, and most recently, Tiffany Helm. And I've, um, I'm have i wondering, did you have any favorite females in the franchise? Um, I, I love Lar. Um, I've oh. known her for a long time. And she is, like, super sweet and such a nice lady and stuff. Um, so she was always... Since part seven was like the one that I really grew up with too, she's always been my favorite. Yeah, um, I reached out to Lara to get her on here, and at the time she said, and this was January, she said she was all podcasted out, but she told me to reach mm -hmm. out to her later, so I might try again with her in December. Nice. I, yeah, I think I could get her on, but I thought I'd give her a break, and she's on my friends yeah. list on Facebook, so I think it should be okay. But, but um, yeah, she's great. Yeah. You got some other short story books on here too. We're gonna to promote your books here. <laughs> Thank you, you got um, White Ash. Yep. Uh, that, yeah, that's my uh, collection of short stories. That's um, kind of more mainstream stuff, like you know, more drama things and stuff. There's kind of different sections in it where the first half are more dramatic stories, and then there's some more uh, comedic stories and stuff like that. Okay, and then you got uh, Mr. Blue Stick, which uh, an interesting little backstory to that about uh, imaginary friends. Uh, yeah, Mr. Blue Stick's about a, a little girl who keeps talking about this imaginary friend um, to her her parents, and then when she disappears, um, her family realizes that this imaginary friend isn't imaginary, um, and so it's kind of a, a thriller and drama stuff. It's one of my one of my favorite books. I'm actually right now. Um, re uh, re editing because I wrote that one when I was like a lot younger, and so we're going to re release it and stuff. I'm going through it and actually writing a screenplay for it, um, and I'm actually writing it for Kane um, because the, one of the main characters in it actually has a lot of burn scars and stuff. So I'm kind of writing it for him. You're not going to get Kane to play Mr. Blue Stick? <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, he's going to. Oh, play he's going to play him. <laughs> I thought he, I didn't think he'd be blue. I mean, burn. I thought he'd be blue. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he has a he has a cane that that uh that lights up, and the little girl names him Mr. Blue Stick because he always has the blue stick with him. They go get Lara to play the little girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, you got uh, look if if John C. Riley can play thirteen and walk hard, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And then you got fifty um, handfuls. Yep, that's uh. Kind of a weepy, dramatic book about a a woman who loses her husband, and his final wish is to have his ashes spread in all fifty states. And so it's a story about her journey going through the country, um, fulfilling his final wishes. Wow! Yeah, I was looking yeah, very different than the the uh, the horror stuff, which is why I you know did the pen name. You love doing the horror stuff, though. Best I take it. I do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And speaking of horror, Tom Savini, I mean, that was originally what um, had uh, David Grove direct me towards you. And oh. and um, as interested as I am with Tom Savini, it's like, boy, uh, you're an interesting character on your own. <laughs> Adrian yeah. King told an interesting Tom Savini story when I interviewed her. She said that he was at one of the uh, screenings for the film, mm -hmm. and she said that Tom Savini was sitting up and – I don't know the balcony or what the seat somewhere, and he was shooting rubber elastics at people. That, for some reason, that's one of his favorite things. Every convention I go to with him, he's always shooting uh, rubber bands at Kane or whoever's around. So, yeah. Yeah, but um, I'm going to tell you something that I found interesting. I was watching a wonderful movie called The Perks of Being a Wallflower and how yep. interesting it was. And what a surprise to see <laughs> Tom Savini in a yeah. non-horror role. Mm -hmm. Do you know how he no, got into that? that? He's such a, a horror guy, but he was he's actually like a classically trained actor. I mean, he did tons and tons of theater before ever getting into horror. 
and that's it. that was his first passion was doing theater um you know even musical theater type stuff and everything and you know he's just really passionate about acting and stuff for a very long time before he ever did makeup do you know how he got perks of being a wallflower it just seems like an odd choice of film and he was great in it uh it's because it took place in pittsburgh and tom is like uh, a giant uh fixture in pittsburgh because um, he was even in Zack and Mira make a porno. He plays like the old guy in it because it takes place in Pittsburgh. Um, and a lot of filmmakers kind of know that, you know, if you're doing something in Pittsburgh, you know, we'll see if we can get Tom doing it. Because he, as as big of a star as he ever became, he never left Pittsburgh. He's lived there his entire life in the same house in Pittsburgh. You know, it's interesting, too, because in Perks of Being a Wallflower, him and Ezra Miller are going back and forth. And that I'm not going to give the joke away, but that final joke he pulls on Tom when he enters the shop class, that was priceless, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've seen the film, I take it, huh? I actually haven't, which is, which is so- shocking because right in his biography, I, I uh, watched like every movie in history except for like, that one. You gotta watch the perks of being a wallflower. Even Adrian yeah, King wrote that down, you know, because she had, yeah. she didn't know he did this. But you gotta watch perks. He doesn't have a big role in it, but he's got a memorable role in it, yeah. and uh, he he just steals it. Him and Ezra Miller, like Ezra Miller's a kid that's a smart aleck in his class, and yeah. you know, and uh, it, he plays the shop teacher, and it, it, it's just priceless watching Tom. Um, yeah do that role so highly recommended do you have a favorite he's tom Savi- on, huh right right now he's actually on um uh, season three of dust of dawn he, he plays one of the main main characters this year so i'm excited to watch that i'm still behind a little on a season so i gotta catch up so i can see him yeah he was in yeah he was in the movie too with that whip yep. yeah but uh do you have a favorite savini movie um probably dust of dawn because that, again, that was right when I was coming up and, you know, being a horror fan and stuff. I was like, I think 16 or something when that came out. And, you know, seeing that was just like, whoa, you know, being 16 years old and stuff. And so, yeah, definitely, definitely that. But, um, yeah, I mean, Tom, Tom is fantastic. That was like the going to his house is like the greatest thing in the history of the world. And I've got to hang out at his house many, many times and sit in his living room and hang out and, you know, hang out in his dining room and stuff. And just every inch of his house has some sort of memorabilia and it's not even usually from his movie it's just because he loves movies so much that there's there's life casts everywhere there's swords on every wall there's godzilla figures i mean there's there's a fortune teller in the bathroom there's his bedroom has life-size uh robots life-size aliens and busts of people all around his bedroom and stuff it's like it's hands down like like a geek heaven it's like the greatest place in the world wow I just yeah. uh, just thought of something too because back at the, the end of August, it took me five months to do this, but I got Caroline Monroe on for an interview, and of course she worked with Tom and Maniac, which apparently uh, she says is still banned in Germany. <laughs> Probably, yeah, it was a controversial film, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah we get to we get to work with Joe Spinell, who unfortunately is no longer with us, mm-hmm. but uh, <laughs> but I remember Tom had relayed a story about that car and. Uh, um, a little bit of uh, non-permitted filming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did. They did a lot of stuff. Yeah, and of course Robert Kurtzman, you're working on his book as well. Am I am I right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, Kurtzman's great. Yeah, uh, it's funny because I was a fan of his, but I had absolutely no clue how much thing or how many movies he worked on until I was I went out to his studio and um, it, which is an amazing, amazing place out in Ohio, and, like. Just, you know, rooms of people working on, you know, robotic things and masks and, you know, special effects stuff. And I was sitting there in one of the workshops, and there had to be like 40, 50, um, 11 by 17 posters all around the border of the ceiling. And I was like, wow. I'm like, it was a cool movie uh, poster collection. And he goes, oh, no, no, I worked on every single one of those movies. And I was like, like completely taken back. I mean, like, like everything like so many movies you didn't even know of like dancing dancing with wolves and reservoir dogs and jingle all the way and misery and just like it was ridiculous so yeah i'm excited to get all the to finish all the stories for for him so uh you got all these going on at once don't you yeah yep um it, it's it's uh, a lot of them are slow process because i had twins me and my wife had twins a couple of years ago so i've slowed down quite a bit um having you know little toddlers run around um, but also, too, you know, these guys are still working pretty much every day or doing conventions and doing all kinds of stuff. So 
we kind of you know chip away at them here and there and stuff. So hopefully, hopefully they come, both come out next year sometime. You mentioned 1996 when you said from dust to dawn you were 16. You're younger than me, I guess. Yep, 36. Wow. Yeah, you're behind me by eight years. Wow. Yep. <laughs> so you were born in 1980. Yep, exactly. Same year as Friday the 13th was released. Yep, a little coincidence. And, of course, another one of my favorite films came out that year, too, Dress to Kill. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I like a lot of the old horror films. A lot of the newer ones I don't find are as good, but this year we've had some good ones. The, the, the Conjuring, The Conjuring 2, both very good. Lights Out, yep. Don't Breathe. Yeah, I really like Don't Breathe. I haven't seen Lights Out yet, but I like Don't Breathe a lot. Yeah, well, I went because I like Jane Levy. She's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if there's a cute girl in it, I'm pretty much drawn, you know, <laughs> as I've mentioned about the Friday films. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, no, I'll, I'm going to tell you, we're getting uh, close down to, to our time here, you know, but um, I was going to say, um, when can we expect um, for the Tom Savini and the Robert Kurtzman books, when can we expect those uh, to be published? Savini's book, I'm hoping, like, spring, maybe early summer next year. Um, it depends, because he's been super busy. He spent, like, uh, we were trying to get it out for this year, but then he ended up spending um, three months filming Dust of Dawn, so we, we lost a lot of time. Um, but he's editing, editing it right now and stuff, so hopefully early summer next year for that. Uh, Kirsten's book, we're still really just starting, but maybe next October. I wanted to talk to him about that soon, kind of. Pitch, pitching to him, trying to get it out for next October or something. So you still work with Howard Berger? Does he work with him? Uh, I, don't, I don't think much, but they're good friends, though, I think, still. I think the first time I heard of Robert Kurtzman, I think they both, correct me if I'm wrong, they worked on Jason Goes to Hell, right? Uh, yeah, basically, it, it was um, him and Nicotero and Berger who started K&B, which is like, you know, the world's largest special effects company in the world. Yeah, that's how, that's how I, I I was aware of that. And of course, Kane Hodder worked in that movie too. So, yep. talk about a small, small world. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it, they're all connected some way. They've all done some movies together. To more than like twenty movies, some of them and stuff. And they've all done something together. In Bravo, to Kane Hodder overcoming uh, a nasty bully situation and uh, doing yep. something that really he should be proud of, and I, I bet he is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the amazing thing with, with Kane's story is how many people have come up to us and thanked us for his book. And it's like, you know, this, it's his story, but since I wrote it, people come to me all the time. Um, and, you know, I, literally we get letters every week about people, how much it affected them and how much emotionally it was. And, and it's amazing because most of these biographies with celebrities, it's, you know, they're really, really interesting, awesome books, but they're not emotional. And Keynes is, I mean, every single person that's ever t talked to me that read it basically said they cried at some point. Um, and we've actually had multiple people who's contacted us, either written to us or in a medicine person, who actually said that they stopped from committing suicide after reading his book, which is, like, completely mind-blowing um, and powerful, the fact that someone actually found that much meaning in his book that they, you know, found a reason to keep going. You mentioned suicide. I want to bring something up. And speaking of heroes, you know, um, I've never been suicidal, but I, I've suffered from depression from time to time because it just kind of hits you out of nowhere. And after, you know, remember the ice bucket challenge that happened la a few years ago? Yeah. Yep. Well, after Robin Williams had uh, committed suicide, um, an unfortunate loss, we lost him. He was great. They yep. started up a campaign called Doubt Fireface. Really? And it involved uh, taking a pie in the face and nominating three people. That's funny. And uh, I, I wanted, to, I did this because, but and I not went after people I interviewed because I felt that because um, my my uh, video only has like seventy four hits in four months, yeah. but um, people want to see people in the industry do it. And I remember one of the people that responded to me was Lisa Langwas, who I loved in class of 1984, which was shot here in Canada. And she did a video, and it got over 500 hits in a week. 
cool. And it was interesting because I had uh, Nancy McLaughlin on here from Jason Lives, and she said, I told her about it, and she said that when she was in, in London, England, this was being talked about on the news. Yeah. And she said she's going to get together with the uh, Jason Lives cast in L.A., and they would all do this. And I get a few others that have also offered to do it, too. I think Adrienne King is open to it if she can find a way to film it. I think she's like me out in the boonies. <laughs> but, yeah, she is, yeah. Yeah, but I think she was open to it. And I think I'm, I'm also uh, trying to uh, get a response from Melanie Kinneman on it as well. But, and, but um, I think a lot of uh, that starts with growing up having problems relating to people, peer pressure, and, uh, of course, bullying and fitting in. And I had trouble growing up fitting in, and I was a loner. And uh, I would sit up in the library, and I would write. And, of course, I would always write about what I'd seen at the movies, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is how I can kind of relate to Kane's um, story. Now, I haven't read yeah. the book yet, but you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you yeah, know what? It's huh? It's powerful stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, um, it was on, an honor to have you come on here tonight. And, and I'm yeah. really glad that you reached out to me because I would have never, have, I didn't even know who you were until uh, you sent me the link to your your uh, website. Yep. <laughs> Steve Grove, no offense to him, he did not tell me. But well, yeah, I mean, it's funny because I, I wear a lot of hats. You know, I do my my publisher hat, and it's just you know, it's about it's about all that stuff and not about me. You know, so so I don't even know if David actually knows all the stuff I've done. And you know, then I have my my writing hat and you know my superhero years and so uh, all different stuff. I'm working actually to get David back on here too because I know he's got the Jean Michael Vincent book uh, coming out. And uh, yep, yeah, yeah, I'm working on that. And uh, I was gonna say too. Um, this is eventually, it's, uh, I'm, you're like nine interviews I got in draft mode right now. <laughs> so it's not going to, this interview is not going to air on here until probably in November. Awesome. That's, that's how many interviews I've got up ahead. So I've been really busy with this. But um, when this is done, I'm going to send you the link and you may post it wherever you please. Sure. But Sometime next year, I'm going to be posting, because it's only going to be on the CHSR site for a limited time, like maybe about three months because of the server. So I just opened up a YouTube account. Now, you're my 49th interview, and I've been putting one interview a week on my YouTube account. And right now, uh, tomorrow, I'm about to put my 22nd interview up, uh, which was with Betsy Russell. I'll be putting that up tomorrow. And... Um, I want to know if, if, if it'd be all right with you. I always put pictures along with the audio. Uh, yeah. Do you mind if I put any headshots or any of your book covers or whatnot on, on yeah, the Yeah, of course. Yeah, go ahead and use, use any of the book covers and um, any of the pictures from my website and stuff you can take. Okay, yep. Yeah. And uh, when, the, the, when the YouTube one gets done, I will link that to you as well. But it won't be until... Probably, I'm I'm going to guess maybe about March next year. I know that seems far away. That's fine. But it'll be on the CHSR page for a while first. Like I said, I got nine interviews that are waiting to be podca or podcasted out. So, but you can check out my YouTube page. Um, I it's under the name Python's Paradise, and um, that's my na DJ name is Python. And under my real name, Greg Gilbert, as the author, and, and my Adrian King, David Grove, Melanie Kinneman, those interviews are all up. I've got a few horror film interviews up there if you're interested to check those out. But uh, yours is eventually going to land there. Sounds and uh, another thing, too, you know, um, if there's ever a chance, and again, I, I know people's schedules are busy, but if Kane Hodder or Tom Savini, or Robert Kurtzman, are ever sure. willing to do an interview, I'm open yep. to having them on. Yeah, I'll let you know, because when, when Tom's book comes out, you know, we always, we'll definitely do a bunch of uh, promotions and stuff, so, um, yeah, always check in with me, like, every three months or something, check in. Same thing with Robert's book, when that comes out, we'll start doing some interviews, and, and then Kane, Kane's a little trickier, because he, he literally gets a hundred and something requests a month or more, so he's kind of picky with them. So, but I'll, I can push on them. 
Well, like I said, I mean, Ted White, I said, sent me his and Judy Anderson's phone numbers, but I'm not going to call them. It, it yeah, just seems, to, thing, yeah. yeah, it would just seem awkward, but I, I appreciate Ted White trusting me with that. You know, yeah. I, I thought it was really cool, but um, I would, but I preferred a message as opposed to, I'm not going to call somebody, you know, but, but um, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Not that I could creep out Kane, but <laughs> and uh, another thing too. Um, I was going to say, where where can we get your books? Just off your web page, or are they on Amazon? Uh, yeah, they're everywhere. I mean, you can get them on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble. Um, there's I know there's a couple of Canadian places up there, the websites and stuff. You can get them. Uh, what's your big bookstore? Is it like Books a Million or Books um, Chapters? Chapters, Chapters bookstore, yeah. Yeah, I believe Chapters sells them all and stuff, and um, you can get you can get signed stuff from Kane um, on our our store from A Make Store. Uh, you can get autographed machetes and autographed masks and um, autographed copies of the book and stuff. Um, so they're pretty much anywhere, and everything I've done too is also an ebook, print. Um, some are paperback and hardcover and audiobook and everything too. Oh, perfect. Yep. Well, Mike, uh, thank you so much for coming on here. I'm really glad I've uh, got to embark upon your story this week because I'm going to tell you, well, I thought I was just going to be talking to a publisher, and then when I looked at your webpage, it's like, you're, you're, ju you're just, you're a happening fellow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome, and you, you kind of got a lot in common with me. Like, I can't believe that I'm able to do this, and... Uh, you're kind of in the same position, and uh, I'm going to say kudos to you and uh, you. being able to do what you do. And like I said, um, when and if their schedules are open, I'm open for those other fellows when they come when they come on. And if you ever have anything else you're promoting, don't hesitate to uh, to get in touch with me because I, you know, I'd be glad to promote whatever you're doing. I will do great. Yeah, I got a lot of horror authors. I'll, I'll send to you. That would be great. And one more thing before we go. Can yep. I get you to do a plug for my show? Sure. Okay. Just say your name and uh, say you're listening to um, uh, Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise in uh, New Brunswick. Can you get that? Uh, okay. So Greg, what was the last one? Gilbert. And Greg my Gilbert on Python's podcast. Python's Paradise. In Python's Paradise in New Brunswick. Okay. New Brunswick, Canada, yep. All right. This is author Mike, and you're listening to... Oh, Greg, what? Sorry, what was the last name, man? Gilbert. Greg. <laughs> you're not the first person to screw it up, so don't worry. <laughs> but the, it's the double G. Uh, all right. This is author Mike, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise in New Brunswick, Canada. Thank you so much, Author Mike, and uh, good luck to you on anything that you're pursuing. And uh, Thanks, man. Keep in touch, and uh, we'll keep uh, your stuff rolling on here. And when this is done, I'll link it out to you. Sounds good, man. Thanks.